Hello everybody and welcome to this new video entitled A Diversified EBITDA Positive Hypergrowth Rule of 40 Plus Portfolio. And this video is an update from the video that I did three weeks ago on the same topic, but I'm updating the valuations and so please in the comment section know that I'm, uh, if it's, this has been three weeks, so it's not, it's not a daily video, right? I'm giving you the update for those who are interested. Feel free to hear uh, to, to my narrative about each stock, or you can just pause the video, take a screenshot, and see what you think of these valuations. But what I'll do is I'll walk you through these stocks. I own every single one of these stocks. Um, many of them are part of my top 10. The stocks that are not a part of my top 10 are Audity, Suave uh, and, and Suave Medical. These two stocks are not part of my top 10, but I've added them here as a replacement for my fintech companies, which my fintech companies, I am removing from my top 10 stocks portfolio videos, the videos only. I'm keeping them in the portfolio, but they are not going to be in videos only because I am looking for a better way to assess banks and to assess financial institutions because this setup right here does not work well for banks. I do not think it works well for banks, but it works well for most other companies. And that's what I want to cover today. So the first stock that I own is number one in my portfolio, number one position, more than a third of the portfolio, and that is Tesla. And what do we know about Tesla? We know that it's getting cheap right now. Uh, really, the, the past week, uh, the stock has dropped quite a bit, and I don't understand it. You know, they reported great uh, delivery numbers for, December, for, for Q4, amazing delivery numbers. Everything seems to be doing well. Cybertruck working well, uh, you know, FSD updates, good news left and right, India, co India uh, mega factory, so many things seem to be going well for Tesla, but the stock is, is not behaving uh, that way, and that's why I think it's cheap. At $230 and change, I think this stock is cheap. To me, this stock is, and this is no financial, no investment advice, but to me, this stock is the, the surest 10x in my portfolio, and that's why it's a third of the portfolio. Tesla, as I've said multiple times on the channel, is, is the standard oil of the 21st century. It's not one company, it's a good dozen companies and growing. And each of these dozen companies have the potential to be a multi-hundred billion dollar market cap business division, right? And and the auto uh, sector, the auto uh, section of a business is, is just the visible part of the iceberg today. But really, what is going to be the value of the supercharger network, right? One gas station that sells electricity, right? For the whole world, what's going to be the value of that? What's going to be the value of FSD when it gets turned on, you know, right? As Elon Musk says, the, the greatest single point of value creation in history when it gets turned on, right? What's going to be the value of decentralized batteries, decentralized energy storage, decentralized uh, compute, what's going to be the value of all of that? And what's going to be the value of insurance, robotaxi, Optimus, there, it's really, it's really, really a huge company. And we saw a tweet uh, two days ago, a tweet from Elon Musk talking about more to come. What's what's more to come going to be? Well, in my view, I think they're going to get into the HVAC world. I think Tesla is going to reuse its knowledge from HVAC in cars and they're going to disrupt the, the, the air conditioning industry and the HVAC industry. And, and that's not a dream, right? That's not a dream. We, we have concrete evidence that they're working on that. So this is, this is a company that's as close to a standard oil as it gets, in my view, and I'm so happy to own it. And I'm so happy to be adding Tesla in the 230 and change price right now in 2024. Oh, and did I forget the most important thing? Model 2 likely coming 2025. That's going to be just insane in my view. And I'm happy to own Tesla. The next stock that I own is what? Is Enphase. Enphase is cheap again. $116, right? It was past 130 two weeks ago. And Enphase, I've covered... Enphase is the, the stock that I've covered the most on the channel, actually. I haven't co covered any stock more than Enphase on the channel. Uh, many of my coverage of Enphase has to do with, say, uh, the technical aspects of the technology, why microinverters, I believe, are more powerful. Um, uh, they're a more powerful solution for residential homes than string inverters. I think they're better suited for residential homes. What does Enphase do? Enphase sells microinverters. They are these tiny boxes that you put under solar panels and they turn 
solar panels that you put on your house's roof, they turn that into its own independent of the grid energy system that you can use to say charge your own personal batteries at the house your energy storage energy backup and in more cases even today is you use your these micro inverters to take the electricity on your roof turn it into ac current and resell it to the grid and that's the solar revolution right there i invest in the adoption of the, the solar revolution and, and, and to me when i take a walk in the neighborhood and i see just 10 percent of the roofs with a solar with solar panels on their roofs, right? And I see just 10% of the homes. In my view, 15 years from now, 90% of the roofs, because it just makes sense. It just makes so much sense to get solar. It is, it is, it is free energy from the moment you've done the capital expense. You have upfront capital expense, but then, you know, these panels, they can stay 50 years. They can stay longer than 50 years. And we'd know that if we had panels 50 years ago, but we don't. They were about 40 years ago. But the panels set up 40 years ago are still around and they're still kicking and they're still doing well. Another big reason why I invest in Enphase is the subsidies, the IRA subsidies, which is which which I find insane. I think it's entirely crazy how much money Enphase is going to get from the subsidies. But the IRA subsidies in the U.S. are clearly benefiting Enphase with the subsidy for microinverters being close to 90% higher than the subsidy for string inverters on a watt basis. I've made multiple videos on Enphase and how much money they're going to get from the IRA bill. You know, the, the value of Enphase today, in my view, is lower than the present value of subsidies that they're going to get over the next 10 years. Alone, alone. And that is why I'm fairly confident the gross margin is going to be in the low 50% next quarter, in the low 50% gross margins, because they are adding those subsidies to that gross margin. And as interest rates drop, by the way, whether it's Tesla or Enphase, as interest rates drop, as they inevitably will in 2024, likely in March, as they drop, whether it is a $35,000 Tesla after the IRA credit, it, or whether it is a $30,000 solar roof, 12 kilowatt solar roof from rent phase, both of these are going to benefit from lower interest rates. And I think the growth of both of these companies is going to jumpstart again. I'm very happy to own these companies. By the way, if I look at the rule of 40, we can see Tesla is above a rule of 40. What is the rule of 40? I add EBITDA margin to revenue growth. And that's, a, that's an estimate of the expected economic value creation over the next 12 months. And if I add both of those, I get 52% for Tesla and 37% for Enphase. So almost a rule of 40 for Enphase. Note how Enphase's uh, rule here is just 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 a little low because the growth, the revenue growth is 12%. But that's because of the interest rate. As soon as that changes and as soon as their inventory issues subside, which which they've guided for Q2 2024 for Enphase, Enphase shipped too many uh, microinverters to their distributor. They have an inventory issue right now. As soon as this subsides, I see no reason why this stock's growth won't go back to 30%. And when you do 30% plus 25%, you're well into a rule of 50 and beyond, right? So I'm very happy to own Enphase. Enphase is my second biggest position, by the way, as far as stocks go. Uh, my second biggest asset that I invest in is, is Bitcoin. But Bitcoin, I don't cover too much on the channel because a lot of my viewers uh, do not appreciate the topic of Bitcoin. And that is okay. That is okay. We all have different tastes in that. Thing, that's entirely fine. The third stock that I own is is is, is a is a CrowdStrike. CrowdStrike is one of my top ten stocks. CrowdStrike is the leader in endpoint security. We live in a digital world. We all live in the quote unquote, I mean, our loosely defined metaverse, which is do you spend most of your waking hours in front of a screen, in front of, in front of a pane of glass, be it a laptop or a phone? If you do, well, you need security on these devices, which we call endpoint devices. You need security. CrowdStrike through its software, Falcon, CrowdStrike provides the leading software in security for your endpoint devices, i.e. your laptop or your phones. And so uh, that security is so important. CrowdStrike is the ultimate network effect type business. They are purchased widely by corporations around the world. Why? Because they have the biggest 
network of computers using the software. And of course, whenever one computer is breached on a network of hundreds of millions of endpoints, once somewhere there is a breach, CrowdStrike is a cloud-based quote-unquote antivirus, and the, 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 the software gets updated as a breach is detected anywhere on any one of the hundreds of millions of devices that are protected by CrowdStrike. So it's a winner-take-most business. It's a winner-take-most. If you, if you are a professional organization, if, you, if you're a leader in your marketplace, you're going to want the best cybersecurity solution. And I'm not the one who says that, but, but clearly based on the number of CrowdStrike, right? 40% predicted revenue growth again after growing more than 56% last year. You know, it's clear that the, the, the CIOs, the CTOs at corporations are choosing CrowdStrike overwhelmingly for their businesses. What's another company that I really like? It's HIMS, right? Entirely different sector, HIMS. What is HIMS? HIMS, quickest way to define for me, it's an e-doctor plus any pharmacy, minus insurance. So IMSS operates outside of the reimbursement system of the United States, be it that, be it that reimbursement system for seeing the doctor or that reimbursement system for buying the drugs. HIMSS entirely operates outside of that system. And by virtue of operating outside of a system, it's able to move so fast. It moves really, really, really fast. It's able to you know, launch a product from scratch, from nothing, to US-wide launch in a matter of one month. And we saw that with the weight loss customized medication that they, they released. It, 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 it took them between announcement and release. It was a matter of two weeks, assuming they had been working for a little longer. You know, maybe it's a few months. This is a very agile company. This is a company that's able to, to launch a product so, so quickly. And HIMSS um, has features of a SaaS company in the sense that 90% of their sales are recurring revenue. There are people coming back, right? Once you get a drug with HIMSS, say you get a hair loss treatment, a hair loss spray, they have a popular hair loss spray that they sell, uh, you're, you're going to get that spray every single month. So every single month, you're going to be paying uh, a monthly fee to get that spray in the mail. And that monthly fee, what does it include? It includes both the cost of the medication and the cost of the initial doctor visit, digital, right? Remote digital doctor visit or provider visit, and the cost of the on ongoing follow-ups where you can you can talk to a doctor at any time if you have a problem. And of course, HIMSS, if you go see HIMSS and you say, I, I want to be treated for this or that, and you don't have an issue, they are not going to prescribe anything to you. They, they prescribed uh, they, 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 they prescribe pharmaceuticals, right? It's not over the counter. They prescribe prescribe real pharmaceuticals. So the, the service includes first seeing a provider, you first see a doctor, and then the doctor independently decides whether you qualify. But if you do qualify for the drug, HIMSS is going to supply the drug. So they're going to be the pharmacy. And your cost for that medication, your monthly cost is also going to pay for your doctor so much simpler. This is this is the this is the the buy now product. This is the, the see a doctor now type of product that people in the 21st century have come to expect from companies of the likes of Amazon. And I, and I, I strongly believe in Hims, and Hims is a top top ten position for me. Let me talk briefly about a new stock that I have yet to do a full coverage on the channel, and it is Audity. Audity um, has one main brand today. They have two, Spoiled Child and Il Maquillage, but their main brand is Il Maquillage. Audity is in the beauty sector. What they do is actually uh, makeup, and I know it's surprising that I would have a, a makeup stock in there and that I would invest in a makeup stock, but actually I see a lot of similarities between makeup and healthcare, uh, believe it or not, uh, in, in the sense that it's an expensive product. It's a product that needs to be customized. It's a product that hasn't changed in a hundred years, much like pharmaceuticals, uh, at least the basic kind of pharmaceuticals. And it's a product that also seeing a disruption, you know, for the healthcare business, it's about the pharmacies, right? In the US, we have 45,000 pharmacies. Do we need 45,000 dollars? 45,000 pharmacies. Do we need that in the era of same day free shipping? The same question is for, for makeup. Do we need to have hundreds of thousands of retail stores that are all going to take the biggest chunk of that gross margin? Do we need to have these stores in a world where you can just get an app, 
scan your face, and then it's going to give you a customized, uh, um, a, a, a customized makeup, right? A, a, a customized um, foundation. What they sell is foundation, a customized foundation, exactly to your skin. You know it's going to work out. And and, and uh, Audity is a, is a very very interesting business in in that sector, in that field. And because they're in the beauty space, they're in a less regulated space, which means that they're able to move really 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 fast. A little bit like Hims is able to achieve. By, by virtue of operating outside of the insurance sector and outside of having to, to apply for reimbursements and to accept all sorts of insurance and going through all of the crazy red tape, all of the crazy paperwork, and, and, and really not a clear value proposition. Whether it's a HIMS or an Audity, I believe these two companies have clear value proposition to the customer. They are clearly focusing on, 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 on customer satisfaction, and it is showing in the growth. If you see HIMS predicted growth next 12 months is 60%, Audity predicted growth next 12 months is 50%, and the growth margin, by the way, are absolutely outstanding. This is the beauty that you get once you do direct-to-consumer sales and you don't go through distributors who have to pay rent, who have to pay employees to sit in the stores, who have to play for nice display, nice shelves, independent advertising. Think about all the stuff that they have to pay for. You don't do that when you do direct-to-consumer. And this, I believe, is part of a revolution. Let me move on to Stoneco. Stoneco is a major position for me. Top 10 right next to Hims in size. Just like Hims, Stoneco is a dirt cheap stock. Stoneco and Hims are actually uh, both of the cheapest stock that I have. Hims is the cheapest stock that I own when it's Stoneco. By the way, if you're new to this channel, this is enterprise value over gross profit, over revenue growth. This is my favorite mer metric. This is my spin on the peg ratio of Peter Lynch. What this does is it, it answers the question, how much am I paying for each percentage point of future growth in gross margin. How much am I paying for that growth? And clearly you want to pay as little as possible for that growth. And you can see whether it's a hymns or a stone, I, I'm paying next to nothing for that growth. So the market is not pricing it that growth. And, and, and you can clearly see that if you look at enterprise value over revenue, and if you, if you know the channel, I use enterprise value and not market cap because enterprise value penalizes companies that have a lot of debt. Debt can be deadly for a company, right? A company with a lot of debt uh, can go bankrupt. A company that doesn't have a lot of debt, yeah, it can slow down. It can go through a lot of slowdowns, but it, it won't go bankrupt if it doesn't have a major amount of debt. So so debt is unsafe for a company over a long run. Uh, but if you look, you know, you don't, you don't need to use my metrics to see these stocks are cheap. If you just use enterprise value, over revenue, over revenue, without even thinking about growth, you can see it's about a two, right? It's just under a two for him, and a two point two nine for Stoneco. You know, when a business with 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 fifty percent growth, with seventy ish percent gross margin, is trading at two times revenue, and by the way, in the case of IMS, it's mostly recurring revenue. In the case of Stoneco, it's a take rate type business where as long as people transact, there will be revenue. I mean, these are, these, are, these are recurring business models. A two, a two to me is, is way too low. These are, these are not companies that have to fight for every single sales. These are companies that have to, that have to fight for one sale. And once they've fought for that one sale and they've sold the product, you have inertia. You have the inertia of that revenue that keeps coming back. So I love these companies very much. Another stock that I recently uh, uh, um, started buying is Shockwave Medical. Shockwave Medical, um, the reason why I buy this stock well, is, is twofold. Is, is first of all, the growth is absolutely outstanding. The gross margin is absolutely outstanding. Uh, they are an FDA-approved treatment for calcium deposits in, uh, in arteries and, and veins for patients with atherosclerosis, heart disease, all that sort of stuff. Very innovative product. Uh, nonetheless, the stock is cheap. It's, a, it's in the first tier of cheap stock in my spreadsheet and look at those numbers. How many how many businesses can you screen that have 80, 87% gross margin, right? 87% gross margin and 57% revenue growth. How many businesses can one screen? Well, there's HIMS. You're right. There's HIMS, but, but not, not, not that many more. HIMS, Stone Coast close, HIMS is close, right? Uh, um, and then you have CrowdStrike, of course, but CrowdStrike is trading at twice the valuation of a Shockwave Medical. And Shockwave Medical, I, I, I listen to a conference call. Um, you know, I like the sector. This is a sector I have no exposure to, MedTech. I like that sector very much. You know, they, they're going to have a lot of potential in China. 
Uh, the CEO spends a lot of time talking about China in the call. China could, could be a bit, very, very, very big for them. Um, and it's an innovative business. And also, like many of his businesses, medical devices businesses, you know, it's a business of selling the hardware first and then selling the supplies for that hardware. And medical supplies are very expensive and they have very, very high gross margins. And so when I look at my, my number, it's really good. And when I look at EBITDA margin, right, 26% EBITDA margin. So that's that's stunning, you know, in a way, in a way, if you look at the rule of 40, only Stoneco has a better rule of 40 at the 91. Only Stoneco has a better rule of 40 than my Suave Medical. So I really like this stock very much. I've covered it on the channel. I will cover it again and I will increase my position in this company. The another stock that I own is Mercado Libre. Mercado Libre is the quote unquote Amazon of Latin America, if there, if there can be such a thing. It's Amazon without web services, uh, so therefore it doesn't come with a crazy valuation of Amazon because it doesn't have Amazon web services. You're just betting on the e-commerce, but betting on the e-commerce portion of an Amazon-like company in a country where, in a country, in a continent, right, where e-commerce has not seen the penetration that it has seen in the US, I believe is a safe bet. I look at Mercado Libre as an Amazon that's buying Amazon 10 years ago, essentially, because um, e-commerce is booming in uh, in Latin America, right? Uh, e-commerce is kind of the norm in, in the West today, right? In the US, e-commerce is normal. It's the norm. It's what people do. Uh, e-commerce is still a megatrend, and it's still in the middle of the megatrend, the middle of that ascending S curve in Latin America. Uh, same could be said, said about Stoneco, by the way. Payment terminals, if you go to, to Europe or the US, payment terminals are everywhere. In Brazil, payment terminals are not everywhere just yet, right? This is, this is growing over there. If you look at the numbers of, of, of Mercado Libre, 35% growth, 57% gross margin. They have, a, they have a clear moat in their distribution system in their delivery system, uh, clear rule of 40 out of 56%. The stock is not that expensive, trading at five times revenue. Uh, and on my metric, it is a, it is a, one of the second tier cheapest stock, one of the second tier cheapest stock. So I like the company very much. Profitable EBITDA margin is 19%. So so I like this company very much. Uh, one thing I'll say about Mercado Libre is it, it's kind of an unexciting company. It's kind of a sleepy, sleepy company. It's a, it's a sleeper stock, if, I make sense, if that makes some sense. It's steady eddy. They, they always beat their earnings. They always do the good. They always... They all, they, they, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're steady. They're, they're, they're a steady business. They're, they're less volatile. They, they have less volatility, which is why I like to own that business. You know, the, the same thing could, could somewhat be, st be said about a, a CrowdStrike. If you look at a CrowdStrike, CrowdStrike is also a very, very steady uh, business. The last stock that I'll put in there is a platform. Platforms are a mega trend. What I love about two-sided platforms, two-party platforms like an Airbnb, is the fact that the company doesn't have to produce the good. The good is produced by people selling on the platform and oftentimes a platform doesn't need to advertise much because people come to a platform like Airbnb because there's a lot of sellers on Airbnb. It's you know it's 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 a self-replicating loop. It's a little bit like like a dating site. If you go to a dating site, you would go to a dating site because everybody's on there. If there's nobody on there, there's no value to the dating site or learning a language. If you're going to be learning a language, you're going to be very appealed by learning a language that the whole world speaks. That's why learning English, learning Spanish, very appealing for anybody wanting to learn a language because everybody speaks the language. The same is true for Airbnb. Airbnb is the biggest seller of customized accommodations in the world. It's the, it's the biggest seller of Airbnb. It's the biggest seller of... Uh, of um, you know, authentic, dare I say, boutique uh, housing and accommodations in the world. And and because of that, by virtue of that, uh, they have an easy time getting people on their platform. You know, you have a whole generation, an entire generation of, of Gen Z, who, when they travel, they just think Airbnb. It's, it's, a, it's a habit. It's a reflex, almost. They open their phone, they open their Airbnb app. So much so that in, in some cities, like New York City, for example, Airbnb has to start listing boutique hotels. Um, and, and over hotel offerings. So 
So it's very interesting. Another thing that I love about Airbnb is they've started getting into experiences and, and I believe over a long run listening to, to the CEO, listening to a conference call over, over and over again, I believe they're going to expand into disrupting the mom and pop rental, real estate rental business, the mom and pop real estate rental business where people, instead of, of renting to a, a local landlord in their neighborhood or in their town that may have 10 property, five properties or even just one property, highly inefficient people may move to just renting their living space on airbnb and just dealing with one platform that provides a layer of trust between buyers and sellers or between in in, in that case uh, 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 lessors and lessees if that makes some sense and airbnb acts as a layer of trust acts as a layer of truth and so if there is an issue you don't have to deal with with uh, with small claims court or regular court you don't have to deal with any of that you don't have to deal with evictions if there is an issue you go through airbnb you go through the insurance and and same is true also for for the rating system the rating system on airbnb is very powerful the fact that you can see the rating of the people you're about to let your space to right the, the people that you're about to rent your space to you can see their ratings you can see if they've been trustworthy in the past and so you can make an easier decision and of course the last thing that i'll say about airbnb is that profitability look at that profitability at 24 percent hivida gross margin you know i just want to point out these are these are special companies you know these are special companies if you look at tesla tesla is a company that's wildly praised as being extremely profitable you can see the EBITDA margin is a 16 percent now it's going to get much bigger don't get me wrong that's why tesla is my number one position but if you if you look at companies that get into a 20 percent EBITDA margin i mean i'm very very happy with with that and 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 these companies i trust to reinvest reinvest those uh, profits Re- reinvest that, that EBITDA right which is a proxy for cash flow reinvest that in the business to keep the growth going and keep that S curve that product adoption going that's the last thing I'll conclude uh, this video with is all of these stocks that I buy they are somewhere early typically on a S curve on a product adoption curve on a product ad- uh, um, uh, on, on a service adoption curve or a product adoption curve and so anything anything you see these are products that are just getting started that are just getting adopted right when i concluded the video with airbnb look at airbnb there are still 10 hotel rooms for every one airbnb sold right you still have about you know 20 well that's not true actually it depends on your on, on your on your country but roughly uh, you know i would argue you, you still have about five to ten non-Tesla cars sold for each Tesla car, right? And so they have about 65% market share in the EV electric vehicle market. Um, but the, it's it's nowhere nowhere near pervasive, right? The adoption's getting started. Solar is just getting started. Uh, digital pharmacy is just getting started. Uh, the, these products are, are just getting started. The, the one that's like most advanced on there, I would say, is Mercado Libre, which which uh, I, I would I would put at about thirty percent adoption. But that's that's the, the most further out. And you know you know keep in mind these companies, all of these companies are growing uh, uh, re- revenue. They're growing their sales are rates at rates that are way beyond the growth of the economy the growth of gdp is single digit right these are companies that grow uh, much more than single digit right two two digit and two two digit with a six right two digit with a five two digit with a four so 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 you know when you when when, when you look at a company like say a hymns growing at 60 percent revenue well that's growing at 12 to 15 times the rate of the economy right so it's so it's growing much faster this is these, these are no mature companies these are companies that are up and coming that are new that are growth companies and that, that i'm very happy to own i'm very happy to have my portfolio be in these stocks and see the opportunity of these stocks being cheaper at the end of this week they are cheaper at the end of this week the first week of january has not been that good and that's great for buying stocks because i don't like to pay a lot for my stocks so anyways this was not investment advice this is no financial advice this is just entertainment please like please subscribe um thank you for watching and have a wonderful day